I'm, I'm Dan Fantasia from Treeline Incorporated, and today I'm here with Stephanie Boyer. She is an amazing individual, and if you're not connected with her, you should be. She is a PhD and professor of marketing and sales at Bryant University. She's a co-founder of Rainmakers, which is super cool technology. It's an ed tech startup that teaches people to communicate with intention and persuasion. And what's so cool about Stephanie's background is she really does has that have that like that sales acumen and background. Many times people don't even realize they have a sales background, but she has it and she's exploded in her career. She was a firefighter and custom agents. And I think I've got that right, but I'll, I'll double check again with Stephanie early in her career as she was trying to figure it out. I mean, she was a USF college track athlete. She holds the draft. She held the javelin record for eight years. And in general, is positively, char positively charged. She's an overachiever. She's been a TEDx speaker. Get what you want. She has been a sales influencer. And most recently, she just created an Audible original six-part series called Six Sales Skills Everyone Should Know. So I just want to welcome Stephanie Boyer to the, to the stage today. Oh, thank you so much. It is it is just terrific to be here. And I have to say, this is the first LinkedIn Live that I've done ever. First one. So I'm so excited to be here and here with you, Dan. You know what's weird? So uh, I just saw one of your posts. You're at 9,998 followers. And I think, I'm not sure, but hopefully I, you might have already surpassed the 10,000 mark. But I hope after this probably event, you will definitely get there. I did. I was so excited. I reached out to the person that I thought it was. And uh, I think we're going to have a conversation with that person. And I don't know, everyone's telling me I have to bake cupcakes or do a dance or something like that. So I'm still trying to figure out what to do. Uh, passing the miles I love it. I love it. You know, you know, um, so I just think you're it's so motivational. I think if people don't know you, and this is genuine, they should get to know you or at least follow you or connect with you. Because if I had a person like you in my life when I was in college, and I bet you you would say the same thing. If you had a person like yourself when you were going through college to help navigate and understand uh, all of the different career paths, especially a, a career path in sales, you would be so thankful. So, so if you could just help everyone understand like who you are and kind of what your story is and why you're so unique and how you got here. Well, as far as getting here to where I am, the path was not a common path. And like you said, like I was a firefighter before. Uh, and I love that part about being a firefighter and, and always being able to help somebody, right? Um, but it was really emotionally challenging to do that line of work. And so I really needed to find something where I could still help people, um, but also not in emergency situations. Right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I was studying in college and I really hadn't studied business at all. I was studying psychology and criminology and um, worked at U.S. Customs for a short period of time, at least. Um, that was exciting, too. Right. And, and you feel like you're in the middle of the action and you get to know what's happening. Um, and along the way, I was always learning and developing sales skills and I just never really knew it. Uh, but after all of that, I did go into sales and I had done some other sales types of roles before. Sometimes I was really good. Sometimes I wasn't. And I was just really fascinated to understand, like, is there is there a path to doing this right, um, to doing this well? And when I started my PhD, I studied that. And the last 20 years, I've been just researching to try to understand how do you help people sell more effectively to have more success so that way they can be really happy in their careers and successful too i love it i mean that's why i say like more, more people need to get to know you for for, for certain because you're doing so many great things you know it's just amazing um is there any are there any defining moments like in your career like you know for for you and i as you're figuring it out it just sometimes takes time and then <clears throat> when you look back, you say, wow, the path seems so obvious, but it really wasn't what, you know, for you, when, when it, it's not obvious, right? Like, is there anything that was defining for you that said, 
all right, I, I get it. I know where I want to go and sales, it's going to be sales and marketing. Hmm. You know, that's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought there of um, what was defining. I can tell you that there was a very clear and serious fork in the road. Mm-hmm. Now I was finishing up my undergraduate studies and I was hoping to go into the master's program and work for a business professor. Um, but I injured my back when I was an athlete and throwing the javelin. And um, I took the GMAT to get into the MBA program. And even though I had a 4.0 at University of South Florida, I couldn't pass the GMAT in order to get into the MBA program. And uh, I was on my way to visit some friends in Orlando. And that's when I got a call from the professor that I was supposed to come work for in the MBA program that would give me a free ride to go to the MBA program. And he was like, Stephanie, what's going on? Like, are you working for me? Let's lock this down. And I told him it was Dr. Marvin Carlins, who's still at University of South Florida. And um, he's like, what's happening with this? And I was like, you know what? I I didn't pass the test. I'm not going to be able to do it. And he was like, listen, go take the test again, do whatever you need to do just to get that 500 on the test. And we'll, I'll talk to the Dean and we can, we can still get you in here. You know, you had a 4.0 in your undergraduate here. Um, so at that point I was like 10 minutes from my friend's house in Orlando. And I knew so much right then at that time that if I went to hang out a little bit, um, it just wouldn't work out. So I was like, Oh my God, it was so clear. I just turned right around and I went to my parents' house in Longboat Key, Florida. And I sat down for like two or three days and I just practiced sitting and trying to take this test. So I finally went to go take the test and I got exactly 500. (laughs) So It it couldn't have been more clear. Now, did I know I was going to go study sales? No, is, you know, going in to study marketing and, and, and that's where I, I started to learn. And when I did my PhD, then it was like, it really set in, but that was such a clear fork in the road where I was like, I have to take this time and do this. This is an opportunity. Right. And so it's always thinking about like, what is this opportunity and being ready to take it, even though maybe I didn't always know where it's going to take me. Um, but just to t- like seize the opportunities in front of you. You know, when, when you think about like all the college kids that you're working with and all the kids that have gotten into sales, um, because a lot of them are, I know, I, I, I didn't know what sales was. I didn't know what recruiting was, but um, when they're considering this particular career. They have all kinds of reservations. You've seen a lot of them successfully move forward in their career and build wonderful careers. So if someone's watching this and wondering if they want to be in sales or not, or why they should consider it, you know, is there, is there any advice or is there any, uh, is there any recommendation you would make to them uh, about a career in sales and what they could see potentially as, uh, you know, their future? Mm. You know, (laughs) no matter what anyone does, they are going to have some kind of element of selling in their life. We're constantly selling ourselves, whether we're in the job interview, whether we're in a meeting with our manager to ask for a promotion, um, whether we're trying to advocate for ourselves or for other people, um, where we're trying to like win people over to our way of thinking, like we are always selling and there's always somebody that's trying to sell something to us. So I would say, regardless of whether your job title is officially sales, you're probably going to be using these skills every single day. So you might as well get good at these selling skills um, because people are going to use their selling skills on you and and you're going to use them. But if you really are um, wanting to get into sales, I would say one of the biggest things is practicing your conversations. So whatever you're trying to sell to understand how it helps people, because sales is really all about helping people. It's not about taking advantage and forcing them to buy a product that they don't need. It's truly about helping people if you want to be successful at sales. Yeah. And it's very lucrative too. Like it's such an incredibly rewarding profession to be in. Um, But it's really about helping people. So in order to be a very good seller, you have to be very good at having conversations with people where you're understanding what the challenges are that they have. And if you can figure out what their problems are and understand, do I have a solution? 
that I can really help them, I can communicate that, then that's everything. So one of the things that they can do every day is just practice these conversations, practice listening, practice asking good questions, right? And and understanding people. You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I agree. It is it is all about genuinely helping people. And uh, sometimes people will come to us and say, I want to get into sales. Well, why do you want to get into sales? And sometimes people say, well, I just like people and I like, I like conversation and the talk. But the real question you brought it up earlier is, in order to help people, you need to be able to listen to them. And if mm. you can't be a good listener, you can't understand their needs and wants and you can't really add value. And, and when I listen, so by the way, uh, Stephanie just launched an, audi an audible book, which is great. It's, it's wonderful. But it's called the, uh, what is it? The six sales skills everyone should know. Because as you just mentioned, your belief is it's not just about being in the career of sales, but sales skills help you throughout your life. And I thought it was wonderful, by the way, Stephanie. Nicely done. I mean, that I'm sure that was a, a humongous project and you must be so proud of yourself. But the the uh, everyone should at least tune into that Audible series. So when you started it, when you thought about it, like what motivated you to to do this, to take this on? Like, is, is this actually who who you always are, or again, is it to help others learn more about what sales is? Well, at my core, I want to have the biggest positive impact that I can have. Absolutely. And so the bigger the audience, the better. Now, when I was first approached by a producer to create this, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome because I thought, gosh, you know, there's a lot of other people that could do this. Like there's probably so many more people that are more qualified than me to create the series, you know, and then I started thinking about my own lessons that I was trying to train people on is that, you know, you can do this. Like this is what I do for a living is I, I train people on selling. And I thought, gosh, what a better way to do this, to really have an impact and help people understand that like a sales profession, for instance, is a great profession to get into. And um, also to learn to have better conversations and, and understand that really selling is about that conversation. So the biggest outlet would be audible. So instead of being afraid to get on there and and to do this, I thought, you know what, I've got to give it my best shot and, and to get in and do it. So uh, when the producer called, I I accepted and we worked on it together. There was an incredible team uh, from Wondrium, uh, which yeah. was formerly the the great courses to kind of help and, and navigate the process. I was great. I mean, and it's you. It is your voice. It is you are doing the series. It, it is. It's very wonderful. It's wonderful. So it, why don't we just talk to everyone? Uh, let's just give them a quick overview of I listened to it. I thought it was excellent. So there were six. There's basically six sales skills. And the first one we you talked about was and I, we don't want to give away the book. What, am I giving out too much here? If we just give them a little teaser on what they are. No, no. I think that's I think that's completely acceptable. Yeah. I mean, the first one was misrepresentation of kind of the sales industry, right? Like, um, what, and I won't give it away, but there are a few things you talk about, like the way people think of sales individuals. Is that right? There, there are. And so, you know, I guess you can think of the whole series as like, this is the sales conversation. This is the conversation people are having. And um, the conversation starts off a little bit rocky because the media is portraying sellers as something that is really negative, right? If you look at the Wolf of Wall Street or the Boiler Room or so many of these movies that are out there, the sellers are taking advantage of people. Um, it's like just really aggressive or pushy or rude or just completely the opposite of helping people. So first trying to understand that that's not what selling is. And if you want to go into selling and that's what you think it is, then you probably should not go into selling because that's not what it's about. And it's just going to continue to damage the reputation of the industry itself. So you've got, you've got that element, you've got the entire conversation that we understand um, that the conversation goes better when you follow a certain strategy, right? When you're talking about like where you find people that you want to do business with, um, you know, how to start conversations with anyone, uh, asking questions, getting into some of the other elements, like trying to present the value that you're bringing to the table, trying to handle the concerns people have about you or what you're saying or what you're trying to accomplish. 
Um, and then, of course, asking for what you want, really advocating for yourself and others. And so really looking at all of the elements of the sales conversation, and then it breaks it down with meaningful insights for people, whether they're in sales or not. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I thought it was excellent. I remember um, my first sales job, one of the one of the movies we all watched was Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Right? Exactly. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some sales leaders may suggest that movie to their you know, sales reps. Uh, may or may not. I don't know. Um, but it is a pretty aggressive and harsh movie. And sales has changed so much over the years from you know then to now it's just uh it's just it's just amazing the um the the other thing that i really liked about this what i liked personally about the series was in every of of the six lessons every single one of them you talk of you tell a story like um there was a story about uh a woman selling you were at you were going out for dinner and she was selling margaritas or they were on like a margarita. Right? You know what I'm talking about? I think it was margaritas. I, can't, I think it was margaritas. But, I'll um, never forget that. <laughs> right. I, one, one of the things you were talking about is, you know, um, just, you know, being, you know, authentic and, you know, down to earth and listening to someone's needs. And at the time you were pregnant, right? And I think was I was. I was like nine months pregnant. You like it yeah. was unmistakable that I was pregnant, wearing maternity clothing, right? And and this is just such a perfect example of um, the waitress that we had at the time. I'm excessively pregnant, right? And and I'm there with one of my friends, and you know, just the the waitress was trying to sell us margaritas and and specifically me and like it's okay you can have a little bit of alcohol in the pregnancy and it's like oh my gosh like could you care less about my well-being and i think there was some kind of like prize or a trip or something that they could win if they if they sold enough of these margaritas and it's like you have to be connected to the person you're trying to sell to and I mean, this was just such a perfect example of a seller having their own agenda, not trying to help me, but trying to help themselves. And then it just is this horrible story now that I have to share with people forever, which I guess is good because it sets as an example of what not to do. And it seems extreme, but that's what's happening all the time yeah. is that sellers are in these conversations and they're not listening and they don't have the buyer's best interest in mind, you yeah. know? There's another uh, chapter in, uh, or lesson, and it's about, um, it's basically about handling pushback, right? Uh, or, or objections or concerns. And sometimes when people are getting into sales, their biggest fear is rejection. Like they don't want to be, they don't want to have to handle that rejection, right? It's so difficult to be rejected. But you do an excellent job talking about pushback and what that means. And I think you actually used, uh, another example, a story of like a 16 year old um, that's that is getting their license or received their license and their parents are saying no. And, and the reason why they're saying no and how we all handle and deal with rejection throughout life, whether you're in sales or not, it's just part of life. You, you remember that 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 uh, that session? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, at, you know, any time that we're going after something we want, the people that we want those things from don't necessarily want those things for us. And so it's really important to get aligned um, and to be able to properly handle this. So sometimes when we're getting pushback, actually more than sometimes, uh, most of the time when we get pushback, we want to have something and someone tells us no, or we have a great idea that we're bringing to the table and then someone squashes the idea, right? Then we get really defensive. And usually if we're like, for instance, in a meeting with someone and we're like, oh, what about this idea? And then someone just is like, no, you know, that's not a good idea. Like, let's move on. Then we get defensive as in we're just like, what do you mean? This is like this is a great idea. What ideas have you brought to the table? Right. So we are just very combative um, or sometimes we're not combative and we just completely withdraw. And we're just like, you know what? Like, I don't want to be a part of this group anyways. Like, if you don't like or respect my ideas, I'm not going to give you my ideas anymore. So it's like we we handle the concerns people have with us or with our ideas or the things that we're trying to accomplish. We often handle it in a way that is just really toxic for everybody. 
But if we can instead, instead of being defensive or like, you know, getting out of the situation, instead, if we can change our mindset and we can lean into what is happening? Like, why is this person pushing back? What's the motivation? Often what we're thinking on the surface or what we're hearing isn't really the problem. So we're just kind of like responding to something that's not actually the challenge. It happens in sales all the time. It happens in relationships all the time. And often you see these arguments continuing to happen over and over again because we haven't really addressed the true heart of the concern. So it's really important to follow the strategies, which we've figured it out in sales and in relationships. And one of the strategies we talk about there is UVA of handling some of the pushback. So um, instead of just getting defensive and, you know, fighting back, whenever someone's giving us some pushback, you know, like, oh, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready for you to take the car out tonight, you know, like this isn't not okay with me, right? Instead of just fighting against, ah, you never let me take the car out. It's just trying to really truly understand. And so asking a question, asking for clarification, um, and it can help in any kind of conversation that we're having, right? So asking for that clarification, like what's the true concern instead of being defensive, because defensive means now you have an argument, be on the same team. Like, oh yeah, like, well, what's, what's the hold up here? Like, what's, what's the, what's the reason? Or like, why do you say that? Or, you know, what's, what's happening in a very friendly kind of inquisitive way. Then we actually get a little bit of information about it. If we're combative, then it's like, there's nothing that's going to be positive that comes out of that. So first step is understanding. Um, And then the second step is validating the person or showing them empathy, right? So if we're teenagers and our parents don't want us to take the car and they tell us something about safety and, and, and drunk driving or something. And, you know, then we're like, well, you know, I get it. Like if I was the parent, I would feel the same way. Right. If, if I were you. Um, so there's understanding what the real concern is. It's not that the parent just never wants you to have fun. They want you to live. Right? <laughs> They're very concerned about your well-being um, and then validating and, and showing empathy. You don't have to agree with it but you have to let them know that they have a reason to feel the way that they feel. And then finally, you come to the point of showing evidence, right? Why is it that you should allow me to do this thing that I want to do? Or why is this thing really going to help you Um, or show some kind of evidence or data or a story about what, what it is you're trying to communicate. And then the final step is getting their agreement. So it's not enough to just tell your story, but making sure that they are now on the same page. So, um, there's one story about one of my students, uh, Jordan Bass, who was a co-president of the sales team here on campus. And he just, he worked so hard. He was competing in sales competitions. He finally had this incredible opportunity, this job that he really wanted. So he came to me and he was talking about the opportunity and he was practicing his interviewing. Um, and it was like daily, he was going to the company website and just really preparing for this very first interview of his for the very first job after college. He had done internships. And um, so he went and he got a suit, a new suit. He got a a portfolio to carry all of his his things. And so he went into the office in Boston, where, by the way, it cost about $44 to park for two hours to go and interview. So excited. He goes in and they send him right back to the hiring manager and the hiring manager as he's walking in. Now, granted, Jordan has been talking about this for like a month straight. So excited about the job opportunity. The hiring manager is like, listen, just to let you know, I'm not hiring any college students right out of college. So I just don't want you to come in with the wrong expectation. Like, so you can imagine if someone is just like, oh my gosh, this is the job for me. It's all I can think about for a month. And I spent all this money on parking and a suit and preparing for this. And then how deflating that must feel to come into the conversation. And it's like, all your dreams are crumbling. But Jordan had done a lot of practice and learn how to handle objections. And so he just was very cool about it. And he's like, oh yeah, why is that? Like, why why don't you do that? Like, instead of like, are you kidding me? I just spent all this money, right? He could have really had a, a very bad reaction. So instead, like, oh yeah, like, why, why is that? And then the hiring manager started telling him why. And he was like, well, 
when we've hired someone in the past, right out of college, they needed a lot of training and we just couldn't support that because we're more like a startup than we are of this well-established company. Um, and Jordan was like, okay, like that, that makes sense. You know, if I were in your shoes, I would feel the same way. And so the hiring manager was feeling like, okay, well, there's no argument here. Like you can't argue with someone that's not arguing back. And so he felt like he totally got the picture. And then they just started having this conversation. And then Jordan was starting to tell him about how he was the, you know, on the sales team and he was a leader on the team and he had competed in all these competitions and he was ranked internationally. And the hiring manager's like, wow. I didn't even know you could study sales in college. Like, is this a thing? Um, and it totally took his defense down. And so then that's when he finally went in for that agreement. Right. So he's like, you know, like, I know you're looking for people with experience because you don't have the resources to train them. So can you see that actually I do have all this experience and I'm going to hit the ground running? And the, the manager agreed and he hired him. And within two years, he already had two promotions. So this is just an example of how a, a small technique that's part of this conversation, to have this meaningful conversation, can make such a big difference in the outcome. He could have lost his temper in the beginning and stormed out of the office. I mean, if it were me, when I was 21, I probably would have just dissolved into a puddle of my own. But he had practiced this so much um, of like how to handle this kind of pushback and taking yourself, taking the emotions out to really understand what the motivation is. And so, you know, if he was just like, well, you know, you should hire college students that wouldn't have overcome the challenge. The challenge was he didn't think that college students had experience. And so it was it was Jordan's opportunity to help him understand that, yes, college students can have experience and I have experience. So by reducing that like defense mechanism of the manager by leaning in, it completely shifted the outcome. And that's why it's just, it's so important to be able to practice these elements of the conversation because you don't get that right the first time you try it. You're all over the place, stumbling over your own words, right? You have to practice and practice and practice in order to get really good at these things so that you can apply it to different areas of your life. Stephanie, it it you may take you may or may not take this for granted, but this is so good. It really is. It is so good. Like for a, a recent college graduate, someone struggling in their career, trying to figure out which direction they want to go. If you're in sales and you just need a refresher, it's just it's awesome to see all the things you learn in sales and how it affects your life. Or even if you're a VP of sales. And you have uh, uh, your child is in college right now, and they're not listening to your advice. <laughs> have them listen to this aud audible series. It's awesome. It's just like this. Exactly what Stephanie's given us is exactly what it is. And Stephanie, is it free? How, how, how do you access it? Is it? It's free, right? Or I think when I brought it up, it was free. Uh, oh, but anyway, just go to Audible and check it out. I th I think so. I think um. That's what they communicated to me. I think if you have an audible, um, like a plan, yeah. Uh, yeah, then I think you can get, it's just the free content that you go with the plan. And if you don't have audible, if you do the free trial, you can listen to it for free as well. Awesome. All right. So I don't think that there should be a reason to have to pay for it, I guess, unless you don't want to do the trial. Uh, yeah. But it's, yes, it's yes. cool. It is, it is worth it. It is, it is so worth it. So I, if you have a few more moments, I just want to just switch gears a little bit. So uh, you're definitely helping. You're definitely helping in, in uh, educating the sales community, which is uh, I'm very thankful for. But you also are the co-founder of Rainmakers, which is R N M K R S, which is an edtech startup that teaches people to communicate with intention and persuasion. Um, so what? So how? You know, you've got a busy schedule. You're doing TED talks. You're doing audible, you know, you're doing all of these things. How do you then also fit in time to be a co-founder, number one? And then number two, um, can you tell us more about the company? Because you're doing some really cool stuff there too. Well, this is really important because the only way that we can really get good at the conversations that we're having, we have to be able to practice the conversations. And so, um, 
at Rainmakers, we've actually done more than half of a million role plays practicing that conversation. And through those conversations, we have found that it takes at least 30 conversations, 30, at least 30, to really get a significant step change in your performance. And the hard truth is that no one gets that amount of practice. Like no sellers on a sales team are getting that amount of practice. And so what that means for the sales team and for the manager and the CRO, it means that the salespeople are practicing on the customers. And when they're having the conversations with the customers and they're not ready for the conversations with the customers, um, then they're going to be churning through the leads. And so that means, you know, no, no reliable uh, or predictable revenue stream, right? Because the sellers are just not ready. They're not prepared. So we created a platform for companies to be able to bring their sellers in and to be able to practice the conversation of their own design. Um, and so what's really unique about this is for the last 20 years, I've been studying the science of learning and as it relates to sellers and, and adult learners. Um, and these people are boundary spanners. And, and so that really makes the kind of training that they get um, so much more important. Um, and we found that you can really master the conversation through practice, but you've got to have opportunities to have that purposeful practice and a lot of that practice with feedback in order to truly get better at that. And just so everyone knows, <clears throat> when you're talking about practicing the conversation, it's with a do you call it an AI bot? I mean, you're practicing. You're you're not practicing the conversation on a telephone call. You're practicing with automation, right? It's like a, you're in a real, you know, uh, sales pitch. We have, and and you know, it's you know, it's funny you say sales pitch um, because it's really a conversation. So you're seeing a lot of these like pitching tools that are coming up, but it's not about being able to deliver a pitch like you're on Shark Tank. It's really about having the conversation, listening with empathy, like really listening and to be able to ask the right questions at the right times. And after talking to many sales leaders over the last you know, four or five years in developing the products that we're creating, those are the things that they're saying, that the people that they're leading are not asking the right questions. Um, and they're not asking enough questions. And when they're asking questions, they're not listening to the answers. Right? And so that's that's really the the challenge that we're trying to solve is, you know, helping them get really comfortable with the structure of the conversation um, and to understand like the process of this, practicing it enough so that when they get into that conversation, they feel very comfortable and confident. They can really lean in and listen so that they can help. Now, you have a bunch of clients that are already using this. I mean, what what are you seeing? Uh, what have you learned from them? I know that you're finding a tremendous amount of success, but is there any common denominator or a success factor that they're finding from your technology? What what we're learning really from our from our customers um, and from just reaching out to people in the market is that the prospects that they're talking to are not looking for pitches, that the prospects are looking for conversations. And they're really looking to speak with somebody, um, someone that's genuinely interested in their needs and that who can take the things that they've heard, those needs and those challenges, and then form that into a solution to their problems. You know, yeah. and, and you can't do that. Like you can't do that without a conversation. Oh, I've, I've obviously I've seen your technology. It is super, it's super cool, right? It is I mean, everything you're doing is wonderful. You just uh, and I think you started this conversation off with um, finding ways to help people, right? I mean, you have the uh, Audible series, which is super cool. And if you haven't looked, listened to it, you you should. Um, you've built this wonderful company to improve really training and education for selling and salespeople, which is just awesome. So I guess as we look to wrap this up, is there any recommendations um, that you would give to a, 
uh, a person listening uh, as they close out 2023 and moving into 2024? Oh, absolutely. Practice your conversations. <laughs> pra like all the time, practice, practice listening. When you're in the conversation, practice active listening and think, am I talking more than I'm listening? And how could I talk less and listen more? Well, you can ask better questions, you know, so practice having the conversations, even if you're tired or you're not comfortable with it, just practice, you know, when, when we're together for the holidays right now, ask your family about their history, ask them about the stories. I'm sure they're going to just completely light up and they're going to enjoy the holidays much more together because you're actually taking an interest in them. So a hundred percent biggest piece of advice is practice the conversations. Awesome. Well, thank you for being with us. How would people, how do they find you? How do they connect with you? Um, you know, how do they learn more about you? Sure. Well, first of all, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Like you mentioned in the beginning of the call, um, I would just make sure that people know my name is Stephanie with an F not with a PH if they're looking for me. Um, so LinkedIn is a great place. If they want to see more about what we're doing, um, as far as Rainmakers goes and that conversation, uh, just go to Rainmakers, R-N-M-K-R-S. There's no vowels in it. So rnmkrs.com. And then um, our CEO actually just started this podcast a few weeks ago. It's called The Cringe. And it's, it's so funny. It's interesting. Um, it's entertaining, but it like, it's so educational too. And he's got these sales leaders that are coming in and they're talking about the challenges that are happening in some of these conversations, but then also what you can do about it. And often, uh, he's ending in a role play. So you can actually see the advice, like actually take life uh -huh. to it. So, I mean, if you're trying to focus on like, how do I improve my conversation? Uh, Absolutely. Like, check that out. I'd say that's a good use of the time. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much. You've been wonderful. I appreciate your time today. Happy holidays. And thank thanks you. for joining. Thanks so much, Dan. It's been a blast.